We are extraordinarily fortunate to have Gary come and share his thoughts, his experience and his motivations as a photographer with us um, here at, in Oxford University in the Bodleian Libraries and in this city. Um, his lectures under the general title of the Light Gatherers have also, ladies and gentlemen, recently um, had another expression in appropriately enough for a library in book form. Um, you may purchase this uh, expression of Gary's life and work and interests and approach um, in this publication which the Bodleian Libraries have produced. I think it's possibly our most beautiful book that we have ever produced called uh, The Dark Room uh, or just Dark Room actually I should um, omit the definite article. Um, so please do uh, make sure you have a copy of this because it is most definitely going to be a collector's item. I should also, um, in case you're not aware, that Gary has two major exhibitions at the moment um, in the Arnolfini Gallery in Bristol and at the National Museum of Wales, in addition to some of his works appearing, uh, uh, where am I, not next door, well, one of them next door and another in, in the Natural Magic show that we have on at the moment and four pieces in the Bright Sparks exhibition, so make sure you come back and enjoy those. But please make sure you go to Bristol to see Ador and at the Arnolfini and go to the, um, the National Museum of Wales to see Morwellian, Morwellian um, <coughs> because this is a fantastic Gary Fabian Miller moment, ladies and gentlemen, um, in, uh, in these nations. Um, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Gary for his fourth lecture, Beyond the Middle Place. Right, okay, so I'm talking, I mean, this is a moment, a strange moment where I have all this uh, activity around my work. Um, so. I, when I do these talks, they tend to be quite personal talks about the life I've lived. Um, and uh, at the moment, uh, we're looking at the kind of very beginning of my work as an artist and, and also the last work I've made. Uh, so this first, uh, first poster image, the one uh, outside the building at the moment, was a picture I made when I was uh, 19. Uh, and then the second uh, image, is one I made when I was 60 or so. Um, and the horizon is a kind of, I have an, a number of recurring uh, forms uh, and, and the horizon is, is a constant from, from the very beginning. Uh, the third slide uh, connects the beginning and the second uh, poster image. So let's have a look and see what I'm reflecting on. I've been writing a lot in my work over the last couple of years uh, because of the, the Dark Room book. Um, there's another book published in uh, the Adore book, which is a similar book, which is my reflections on, on life and uh, the things that matter to me and my work. Uh, so, so there has been a lot of writing in these last few years. Uh, today at Arnolfini in Bristol, my exhibition, A Door, begins with this picture from the 1976-7 series, The Sea Horizons. I printed this image um, in 1976 when I was 19. It has been heavily worked in the dark room. So I began working in a zebrachrome dark room around 18. Um, and... I was learned teaching myself to print, like most people. Um, and so this is a heavily worked um, print from the transparency. Uh, I was young and I wanted there to be a great storm of change, which I would become part of. Um, 
this early sea horizon embodies this. It's uh, a, manifesto, a manifesto by a, a young person wishing to remake the world. This is, uh, this is me in 1976 when I'm making these pictures. Uh, I had discovered art and that it could be a catalyst for change. So this, this came from just hanging out as a teenager in, in, in art galleries. Um, and art galleries changed my life. Um, and books found in art gallery bookshops. And uh, music found in clubs in Bristol. And, and I knew the purpose we had was to, to, to be creative and to basically shake it up. Um, I believe we are like sensitive cells who find and make our weather. Today, across the Seven Estuary at the National Museum in Cardiff, uh, this image echoes across the water to Bristol, here seen in its 1997 reprint, part of my exhibition, Morwellian. In 1979, Arnold Feeney gave me my first exhibition, which included these early sea horizons. Uh, for a short period, they became very visible. They were shown in many group exhibitions, uh, including at the Serpentine. Uh, this, this was my first show in London, and it was my first experience uh, of being an artist. Um, I had nothing to judge this initial interest, uh, but I did know that I had found uh, my core subject at the horizon. Um, it was has such clarity and, and resolution. And it was an, a very fortunate place to begin. Um, I was then lost for some years, seeking a true way of working. Uh, and, and I felt for quite a period that perhaps that was it. I'd found the, the, the one subject um, and I found it at the beginning. So it was, it was, it was difficult for a period of time. Um, and I was looking for a subject or a way of working which had the same depth and meaning. Um, in 1995, I had a two-person exhibition um, which was called Elective Affinities with Susan Durges. Um, and this opened a new gallery in Court Street. And Mark Hayworth Booth, who was curator of photographs then at the V&A, wrote a catalogue essay in which he included a sea horizon. Um, the, so these pictures were re reappearing for the first time after 20 years. Um, this was the picture that he reproduced. It was about the size of a, of a postage stamp within his text. Um, and then this prompted um, Maria Morris Hamburg, the uh, photography curator at the Met, to to contact the gallery asking what this picture was, where it had come from, where it had been. Uh, she was aware that its subject in composition predated other subsequent engagement with the horizon, um, such as Sugimoto's black and white sea pictures, but she could see that this was made in 1976. Um, so the dealer, as with lots of dealers, you know, I've, I've lived a life with art dealers, you know, that's a tough life to have. If you're 60, you know, that's that's a long time to be working with art dealers. Um, I'm 66, so it's an even longer time. Uh, anyway, so really they had no knowledge of this work and they said, well, you know, come on, what's the answer to this question? Where, where, where are these pictures? You know, why haven't I seen them? Uh, so I, I gathered all the dormant prints uh, from the store in my studio um, and gave them to him. And, and within a season, they'd all been acquired by uh, collectors. Um, uh, fortunately, I have I held back seven of these unique prints from the beginning, um, and, and three of them are in the exhibition in Bristol. Um, so the consequence of it was that this re-engagement in 1997 with these pictures, which are 20 years old, meant that we printed 40 images from the original colour transparencies uh, in an addition of five with, with two artist proofs. And, and had an exhibition a year after the, the first kind of discovery of them um, uh, at the same gallery. And these were accompanied by a beautiful book. Um, so 
So one of the best things about working with this dealer, Michael Hugh Williams, was he was totally committed to making beautiful books. Um, so, so, so there was this really significant publication um, which contextualised and placed this work into the art world and he, he showed it. And then it uh, toured the exhibition and it, and it went to Arnold Feeney as one of the venues. Um, and, and, it was, and it just, everything just took off um, in, in my career as an artist. Um, and, and within five years, this is over 200 prints in the edition, uh, had all gone to, to uh, collectors and collections. Um, but I'd chosen to hold back uh, an AP set, uh, wanting them to remain complete, uh, hoping that they would find their right home one day. Um, so they, they would periodically come out and be shown to people, and then they'd go into a box and be put under a bed, um, and would just sit there waiting um, for the, the right time. And, you know, I could have so easily broken them up and sold them, but, but I, I knew they had to stay together. Um, and it's this group of 40 which, which hangs in Cardiff today uh, in, in the exhibition Morwellian. So this, this fills the photography galleries of, of uh, the museum uh, and it's the first time that they've been seen together um, after nearly 40 years. So I had, had never seen all 40 hanging in a gallery until I went into the opening of the exhibition. Um, on the 17th of February. Um, on the gallery's wall, it says, I looked into the edge space of the world for the first time in 1976, uh, when I stationed a square format camera on the roof of my home in Clevedon and looked across the Seven Estuary. From that moment, I became a collaborator in a great performance orchestrated by weather systems and the sun cycle. For two years, the prospect of changing tide and sky was my universe. I began to understand how light makes an exposure of land and sea palpable, allowing it not only to be examined, but also to be absorbed and felt. I realized that human beings are silvered, light sensitive cells, just like the materials of chemical photography. Over a lifetime, each of us builds an internal library of unique exposures like these 40 fragments. The, the squares of the sea horizon represent the only significant body of work I've made with a camera, but they are the basis of my understanding of the essence of photography and of my belief that a commitment to place can provide the foundation for a meaningful life. My rooftop lens and shutter allowed me to investigate an illuminated space in perpetual flux and to capture its essence instant by instant. But I came to regard them as a mechanical encumbrance. I, did, I wanted to work with light directly. And so in this kind of interim period where I'd made the sea horizons and continued to try and make work with a camera, um, I struggled and then in 1985 I realized the problem was a camera and and I put the camera aside and 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 began to explore how I could work directly with a beam of light and the light sensitive materials thereafter the, the dark room became my laboratory and the pivot of my daily observations I examined the last of the sunlight as it seeped below the horizon knowing that I was assimilating my exposure to the world. I knew these physical impressions. Uh, I took these physical impressions into the dark room and retrieved them. For example, by channeling a light beam through a blue glass vessel filled with water and allowing it to fall upon light sensitive paper. From the darkness, I could release the unique image like this, uh, the frozen sea into the room and then onto the materials. Uh, this picture is, is in Morwellian. Um, the exhibition Morwellian brings together both the beginning and the end days of my career. 
it is an elemental portrait of the coastline of South Wales, but I hope perhaps also a meditation on the promise of a new world. In February, at the opening of, of Morwellian, uh, the museum announced the uh, acquisition of the, the entire piece for the national collection um, and uh, core funding they secured from the art fund and they are raising funds for the, the balance. Last autumn, uh, I stood on the foreshore of South Wales, looking back across the Severn, uh, beyond the horizon to the point I had stood 38 years ago, then looking outwards into the future. Um, so here I'm standing it on the beach in Penarth, and I'm looking across to England, and I could see the place, the hill, where I had stood and looked back uh, 38 years ago and, and spent two years looking this way. Um, that, was, uh, that was a really powerful uh, day. And I mean, a lot of what's happening at the moment is, is this kind of um, beginning of my career and the end of my career and, and the life that I've lived in between being looked at by me and by the people. Um, but as a wonderful Little Sims, great singer and writer uh, said, I wondered, how did I get here? How did all this happen? We both knew that that Sims and I, that we could make our weather, that we could become who we believe we could be, and we could shape and change our world, and hopefully the wider world. And that's kind of what happened to me when I was a teenager. You know, I knew that's how it could be if you were to believe, and I, I gave my life to believing that, and that's what I still try to believe. Um, my life may be ending, but it feels like a life well lived from which I can still act as a catalyst with others to help bring about change. And that's kind of really when I've been thinking about what I'm talking about is in thinking, thinking about this lecture. The lecture is really all about the fact that I believed the new world was over the horizon and I just knew that in my gut. Um, and I had to get to that place like so many people and that's really what I committed my life to. And, and the place there was going to be the world we needed to have and not the world we have to live in. Um, today, Arnold Feeney, the er earliest sea horizons are joined by a series of five pictures from the original uh, exposures. Um, so I'm showing a group which were printed in 2012. So this is, the horizons just kept coming back um, and they came back in 2020, 2012 for the last time. Um, and I could now revisit the transparencies and have a level of restoration made to the ones which I hadn't been able to print from before. And Cibachrome was now gone, so an edition couldn't be printed from Cibachrome. So they became C types um, made from the last group of restored transparencies. Uh, this group of five, um, which are hanging in Arnold Feeney at the moment, were first seen in the 2013 Hayward Touring Exhibition, Uncommon Ground, Land Art in Britain, 1966 to 1979. Um, Andy Goldsworthy uh, and myself formed the end of this exhibition's history. Uh, together we were showing with the artists that had inspired us when we were teenagers. So in his case, uh, David Nash. In my case, uh, Jan, Devi Jan Dibbitz, uh, Hamish Fulton, the great, great Roger Ackling, uh, amongst others. And so this is 2013, so this is 10 years ago. And this was, this was a bit like this moment. It was kind of like immensely moving. Um, and I remember going to the opening in Southampton. And there I was with all these, you know, this generation that I would go and see their exhibitions when I was a teenager and, and somehow the curators had decided that the Sea Horizons in 1979 in Andes 
kind of first work marked the end of this moment which they described as British land art and that that was immensely powerful um you know like it was like you be, you began to realize you were, you'd been doing something um and 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 you belonged in the place that you believed you wanted to be part of um when i'm asked to speak about my work which i seem to be doing quite a lot through this project um uh, the narrative is always very personal and uh you know i feel like i feel the bodleian lecture presents me a, a challenge um this is the only way i can i can contribute um and my contribution only has value if it honestly reflects an emotional and felt experience of of making which is principally what i do looking which is what is fundamentally what i do and then reflecting and thinking and you know so much of my work is is within the mind um and trying to make this visible and that's all the things which my life is made of um so today i'm reflecting on the middle place and this edge point the the point of departure our ongoing desire for a new world this all began with the first sea horizons and it continued mm -hmm. always embodied in the dark room exposures which began in 85 when i put the camera aside um i began to make horizons again uh in the mid 90s around the time that the uh sea horizons re-emerged and found their audience um i had now become the light absorbent surface from which images are then printed they still come from a real place my hill walks on dartmoor and the in same intense deep looking uh, in the mornings, I would walk on Black Hill. Uh, I'd look east and I'd wait for the sun to rise from the horizon of Lime Bay. And then in the eve evenings, I'd go to Hamildown, which is a kind of great ridge um, in the middle of my kind of personal landscape. Uh, and I'd watch the sun fall into the distant hills on the far southwestern edge of the moor. And I knew beyond those hills, the sun was going to fall into the mouth of the Severn Estuary. So the Severn Estuary runs down and it joins, becomes the Bristol Channel. And then it travels out into the Atlantic Ocean and it would fall into the horizon there. Um, so this ending place, the Western Horizon, um, has been you know, the kind of constant thing across my whole life. Um, a sight of, of longing, of sea departures, a searching for a new world, a better world. Such longing fills embedded in England's southwestern peninsula, which has been my home. I was born in Somerset, but for a brief period, you know, my whole life has been left and lived in the southwest. Um, and it's, it's, it's a place which is all about projecting beyond the end of this country, I feel. Um, often I rest on the burial cairns. Hamildown has a beautiful series of, of burial cairns along its ridge. Uh, and I would kind of rest there as the twilight came, soaking up the fading light, the blue black of, of night filling its space, uh, uh, wondering. Uh, on occasions, the moon casting back the lost sun's light, I would imagine I had set sail into the ocean, peering from the prow of the boat, leaving the land, the rhythmic advance and breaking of waves travelling across the shore as I travelled away into the moonlit sea. It was from moments like this that uh, this series, um, 2000, 2001's Thoughts of a Night Sea, appeared. A place that George Fox the founder of Quakerism, described in his journal in 1647, I saw also that there was an ocean of darkness and death, but an infinite, infinite ocean of light and love, which flowed over the ocean of darkness. It is this hope um, that has also sustained me living in such dark times, knowing my role was to build my library of light. This made from my intimate relationship to a small area of Dartmoor, uh, a circle barely eight miles in diameter, which ha 
handled my live life over the last 33 years. This is my crucible within which all the exposures have been made, then made permanent in the exposures created in the dark room. So in the exhibition in uh, Bristol, there's uh, one of the galleries is given over to the idea of the crucible. Um, and, and there it is on the wall, there's a huge map and, and it, it shows you this circle and it shows you the principal walks um, and sites that I return to and then various images of these and kind of information for you to go and walk these places um, amongst other things, including uh, this wonderful um, figure, uh, one of six, six um, human figures from about three and a half thousand years ago found in the clay pits just below uh, the rising moor um, and that sits in the crucible gallery you know that's that's like I just just I've wanted to have that in an exhibition for 20 years and finally I've managed to get it into into the, into an exhibition and it's in the right exhibition um, in my uh, latter years the horizon and the edge place have begun to slowly fade uh, I felt I had gathered all the exposures I would ever need. This was fortunate because my medium and dark room were ending. Uh, I now explore how to continue giving my horizon exposures a new life, seeking ways for them to be active in new me mediums and spaces for new audiences to encounter. So I thought I'd kind of end with two manifestations of that. In 2017, uh, I embarked on my first tapestry, voyage to the deepest darkest blue which was um, um, an image i selected from the larger voyage series of which this is one um, this was then made over 18 months uh, with wonderful weavers at dovecott studios in edinburgh um, here uh, my dark room time had entered an even slower passage of time in making and I thought it would be useful if we saw a sense of how I take a horizon exposure and transform it in, into to, to something else. So we're going to look at this film, which lasts about three, three minutes.
I just kind of pause here for just the last few seconds, but this was the first time it was shown. And and here we had one of the vintage 1976 Horizon pictures. Um, which is in Bristol at the moment, and then to the left we've got Gustave de Grey seascape, uh, which uses a similar method of working to not so much this piece, but to the other film I'm going to show you, where I take exposures and layer them. And the way he brought two negatives to make an exposure on this this uh, seascape. So this was a, a lovely moment when we borrowed the Gustave de Grey and showed it in relationship to the Horizon uh, pictures. Okay, should we just have the last bit of film? Okay, so my future work is often now uh, a collective sharing. Uh, in 2018, I also uh, began, began collaborating with my son, Sam, uh, on an ongoing series of experimental films made from the darkroom exposures. But these began in 2018 with the last evenings, which we made for the opening of the v &A's Photography Centre. Um, so it was screened there, um, and then it became a hidden work. Um, a version appeared in an event in Oxford, uh, feels like four or five years ago, with Alice Oswald. Alice Oswald was involved in me in the first version in, in um, 2018, and then we kind of reworked elements of it um, for an event around her inaugural lecture as Professor of Poetry. Um, but, it, but it really appears for the first time for everyone to see in the exhibition The Door at Arnold Feeney, and in in Gallery 5 at Arnolfini, um, there's a dark space, an installation space, and, and we're showing five of our films in there for the first time, um, including a version of Last Evening. Uh, evenings. Um, and they're a manifestation of my ongoing desire to contribute to the belief that together we make this new world, and really that's what I've committed to always, but particularly now, because now I use the exposures to collaborate with other people to make something which is bigger than myself and bigger than them. Um, and the, the tapestry is an example of that. Uh, the films are. Um, so I'm going to end the lecture and we may have time to see the Bodleian edit of last evening's. Um, it begins with um, um, a, a longer poem which Alice, Alice Oswald wrote um, and so we just have a fragment of it at the start. It has uh, music by, by Oliver Coates, um, who, who made the original score for the 50-minute version. Um, and this is a, a new, 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 new score he's, he's, he's given me for this, this version. Um, I will end the, the lecture with this uh, film. Hopefully there might still be some time at the end for, for questions. So uh, it's slow. So kind of give yourself up to it. Um, it's a place to fall into um, and be absorbed and embraced and held safe. Um, and I was really moved by the exhibition guide that Arnold Feeney wrote. And they, because Bristol's like the heartbed of the true radicalism, which we desperately need in this country, you know, working in Bristol is great because I'm working with young people who believe. And so Rising Arts Agency is an empowering agency for young people in art. Um, and, and they wrote the guide and it's just a very wonderful thing. And uh, when I was given it to read, you know, this is how they begin. Uh, the word door feels like a hug, uh, which is fitting for an exhibition of work that feels a bit like a hug too. If this is true, then my life has been worthwhile. So prepare to be hugged. Uh,